I would say I know how to silence a room, but I don't think it was me walking up here that made everybody hush. I am so excited tonight um, that we have Scott Pelly here. My name is Alice Knapp. I'm president of the Ferguson Library. Thank you. And as I talk, this is your opportunity to silence your phones, but this is an exciting night. So if during the talk you want to take photos, you want to tweet this out, you want to put this on Facebook or Instagram so everybody knows where you were tonight, feel free to do that. <laughs> We are so lucky because we've been working on civility for the city of Stamford with our good friends at Hearst Media and the Dylan Schneider Group. And tonight, Jan Dylan Schneider will be introducing Scott Pelley. I, I just have to say, if you haven't had a chance to see some of Jan's artwork, this weekend is a good weekend to go to Woods Hole because she's going to have an exhibit opening there. And her artwork is absolutely beautiful. And with that, I'll introduce Jan. Good evening. I didn't expect the plug. <laughs> I am very honored to be here and to be able to introduce Scott Pelley. Um, as you probably have heard, this civility series is uh, put on by not only Hearst Media, but by the Dylan Schneider Group. It's kind of the brainchild of my husband. Um, not as though we think people are not civil. We just think it's a subject to study. Um, Today, tonight, you're going to be hearing Scott Pelley, a much admired journalist, admired by viewers and by all the news media. Um, he's on the par of gentlemen like Walter Cronkite, David Brinkley, and Dan Rather. That's a lot to say, but he's quite a gentleman. <laughs> he's got to live up to that. So. Um, he happens to be from uh, Texas, was born there, but he's kind of a hometown boy. He's living in our neighborhood now, and we very much want you to listen carefully. Um, I also got his book, which is over here, in case you want to get one. It's called Truth Worth Telling, and I think those three words say an awfully lot about today and what's, what's going on. Um, as a matter of fact, he's a rather civil gentleman himself. So with that, I will introduce Mr. Scott Pelley. Jan, thank you. Thank you so much, and, and thank you all for being here. Many thanks to the Dylan Schneider Group and to Hearst and to the Ferguson Library for sponsoring the event tonight. You know, I, I love having a, a captive audience because working in television, I'm usually at the mercy of the remote control. One button and I'm gone. Which reminds me of a time that my son and I were up in the Adirondacks and he was uh, just a little guy, about six years old, and I had arranged to get a canoe and I was going to go out just dad and his boy out on this beautiful lake, Lake Placid, many of you have been there. And I arranged for the canoe first thing in the morning at dawn. And we push out, it's every father's dream. And the mist is rising, and the loons are calling, and the deer are jumping, and it's just the two of us. We're paddling along every father's dream. And as we get out into the lake, I hear the soft, sweet sound of my little boy, and he says, Dad, do we have to do this? <laughs> So for the next 20 or 25 minutes or so, you're stuck in the boat with me. <laughs> and I'm really, really pleased to be here. You know, the Ferguson Library began with a gift from John Day Ferguson in 1877. And I was thinking, what faith in the future? What faith in us to start this temple of, of education, learning, and civility, 12 years after 750,000 Americans were killed in the Civil War, 14 years after the 17th Connecticut Infantry 
had 28 killed and 94 wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg alone. And yet, here and in other places all around the country, great monuments to learning, great monuments to the future of our country, the next generations, were built because they understood in those dark days what a magnificent future America would have. I believe that we are now living in a period of discord in our country that we haven't seen, in my view, since Vietnam. Such division. And so I jumped at the chance to speak on the subject of civility tonight. What a, what a wonderful concept and what a dearly needed conversation that we need to have all, all over the country. One of the things that concerns me the most about our near-term future is the way that, ironically, the technology of communication has walled us off from one another, the opposite of what you might expect. Never before in human history has more information been available to more people, and that's a great thing. But it's also true that never before in human history has more bad information been available to more people. And now with the proliferation of media, not just the cable channels, but the internet as well, we are able to wall ourselves off from one another in digital citadels of confirming information. We can choose the kind of news we want to hear. We can find a channel or we can find a website that tells us that everything we already believe is correct. What a warm and wonderful feeling to know that everything we believe is correct, but that's not how democracies work. That's not how our country has ever worked. I fear that we are facing a new Cold War, but this time a civil war. This is one of the reasons that I wrote Truth Worth Telling, because through my career at CBS News, now 31 years and 21 years at 60 Minutes, I have met people in the United States and all around the world that exhibited the greatest virtues and values during some of the most difficult times in their lives and in the life of our country. And so, if you'll permit me, I'll just read a couple of passages from Truth Worth Telling and give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about. The chapters in the book are named after virtues, things like courage and selflessness and originality. And one thing that I would like to read to you is something that I came across in Iraq during my time there covering the war. I was at the Air Force Theater Hospital in a town uh, in Iraq called Balad, and this was a collection of 33 tents. But inside those tents were the most sophisticated operating rooms and emergency rooms perhaps in the world. This was where our most seriously wounded soldiers and Marines were brought from the battlefield. In order to be close to the battlefield, the hospital needed to be within about 30 minutes helicopter flying time from where the fighting was occurring so that they could reduce the period of time it took to get the troops into the operating room or into the OR. The surgeons who worked in the OR, tell your husband we've already started. <laughs> the surgeons who worked in the OR wore sidearms while they were operating because they were so close to the battlefield. I was in the ER one day when a young Marine named Kenny Lyon came bursting through the door. Kenny was bleeding from three severed arteries. He had been hit by a mortar 
when he was outside his armored vehicle and he was losing his life in that very moment that he was coming into the the ER and so they stabilized him for a moment and then rushed him right into the OR. There were five surgeons working on Kenny at one time. One at his head, two at his chest and, and two at his legs trying to stop the bleeding. If they could just stop the bleeding from those three arteries they'd have a chance to save his life. Well this chapter is called selflessness and you'll understand why. It centers on the nurse who is in charge of the OR. Her name is Paulette Shank. And during her normal life in the Air Force Reserve back in the United States, she was an OR nurse at a hospital in Pennsylvania. But in Iraq, she was Lieutenant Colonel Shank running the OR at the Balad Theater Hospital. Here's just a short bit from Truth Worth Telling. It begins with a quote from Paulette. It's a battle, you know. Sometimes people are fighting to die, Paulette Shank told me. She was a nurse anesthetist from a hospital outside Philadelphia, but in Iraq she was Lieutenant Colonel Shank, Air Force Reserve, in charge of the operating rooms at the Air Force Hospital on the Iraqi Air Base. Fighting to die? I asked her meaning that their body is going further and further in the wrong direction and you have to be able to resuscitate them so that we can stop that negative spiral downward so we can go back to the spiral of life. Shank stood over Kenny Lyon in her pastel scrubs, a abstract watercolor ensemble in pinks and blues and greens. A blue hairnet capped her close-cropped hair which was brown tending toward red. Her face was free of makeup that might have covered the scattering of freckles that bridged her nose. In her late 40s, Shank worked with a quiet, gentle confidence that told everyone in the room that she had done this 10,000 times. If Lyon spent another minute in the emergency room, he would reach the end of his spiral. I followed as he was rushed into the next tent, an operating room, where five surgeons went to work. IVs of blood and fluids would buy time, but if they couldn't stop the bleeding soon, they would lose him. The surgery went on for hours, and after about two hours, a nurse came into the operating room and said, we're out of blood. All of the fresh blood in the blood bank had run through Kenny Lyon's heart and out onto the linoleum floor. They had to amputate Kenny's left leg because that artery just could not be repaired. As I'm standing there and the surgeons are looking at each other like, well, what do we do now? Paulette Shank calls out to the room, I'll get you more. She bolted out of the operating room. More, I said to myself, there isn't any more. I ran after Shank through the plywood corridor that led to the next tent. When I entered the blood bank, she had already opened her own arms. Lying on a gurney, under the glare of bare fluorescent tubes, her blood was draining into plastic bags. She gambled that these pints might stall the deaf man while loudspeakers announced the blood shortage to every available airman. Walt Whitman captured the sense of this. The American poet was a nurse in the Civil War. In The Wound Dresser, he writes of a fallen soldier, one turns to me his appealing eyes, poor boy, I never knew you. Yet I think I could not refuse this moment to die for you, if that would save you. Paulette Shank told me, our job is to resuscitate, to allow the surgeon's time to stop the bleeding. And you try. Her voice cracked under the weight of memories. You try so hard, and sometimes you're not successful. She paused looked away to a distant time and closed her eyes. 
Her voice dropped into a whisper. And it hurts. You feel like you let the soldier down. The wicked death spiral won and you fought so hard. We fight so hard against him winning. And you know, sometimes the deaf man wins. But not this time. The blood that Paulette Shank sent into the operating room bought just enough time for the airmen, I counted at least 80 before I stopped counting, lining up outside the blood bank who had come running after the announcement on the loudspeakers and they started passing blood into Kenny Lyon. His surgery went on for five hours, but they saved his life. I met the conscious Kenny Lyon about three months later at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington. He'd lost his leg, he was trying to get used to his new prosthetic leg, part of his jaw was wired together, he'd lost a little bit of his tongue. And I sat down with him and I said, Kenny, how's, how's it going? And he said, it's going great. And I said, what, what do you mean it's going great? He goes, I'm alive. And this is a direct quote. Kenny Lyon told me, it's all gravy from here. <laughs> but these are the kind of values that I, I think we all need to be like to be reminded of, particularly in these times of division, to remember that we all share these values. Nobody asked Kenny Lyon who he voted for. Nobody asked Paulette Shank who she voted for. But they were there together. One needed the other. And selflessly, Paulette Shank contributed enormously to saving this young Marine's life. That's what Americans do, of all stripes. We come to the aid of each other in times of need. There's a, another character from history who is the subject of the chapter in the book called Courage. This is not an American. This is a Chinese man by the name of Bao Tong. And Bao matters because he was the chief of staff to the Chinese president immediately before the Tiananmen Square massacre. And Bao was dead set against sending the army into the square to clear out the thousands of young students, by, primarily, who had erected the Statue of Liberty in the middle of Tiananmen Square. But we all know that the hardliners won that argument and one of the first things they did before sending the troops into Tiananmen Square was arrest Bao Tong. And they put him in solitary confinement for years. In 1997, I was the chief White House correspondent for CBS and the president, President Clinton, was going to China first president to go to China since the Tiananmen Square massacre, and I desperately wanted to interview Bao Tong. Now, Bao had been released a few months before we arrived in China. How much do you think this man, who just got out of solitary confinement after more than a decade, wanted to talk about his government on CBS? Very, very much, as it turned out. That's why this chapter is entitled, Courage. Now, we had a problem. Bao was under 24-hour surveillance. There was no way that the Chinese were going to allow me to go to his home. There was no way the Chinese were going to allow him to come to me if I had an interview set up in a hotel room somewhere. So we had to come up with an idea for doing an interview with Bao. I was with my producer, Bill Owens, at the time. He's now my boss, the executive producer of 60 Minutes. Remember what they say about being good to people on the way up because you're going to meet them on the way down? Well, I, uh, Bill used to work for me and now I work for him. And we were also with Natalie Liu, who's a, who was our Chinese uh, producer in our Beijing bureau. And Bill came up with a plan. 
that would unfold in Purple Bamboo Park. Purple Bamboo Park is a 115-acre oasis of lakes and lawns in northwest Beijing, an affluent part of the capital where universities are clustered. When we arrived in the park, summer was blossoming. The sky was gauzed with high cirrus. Families in canopied boats drifted through groves of lotus, propelled by gondoliers sculling red oars in a lazy rhythm. <laughs> One boy, pleased with his cleverness, plucked a broad lotus flower and raised it against the sun like a parasol. Along the edges of the park's concrete trails, bamboo pickets were set up to keep visitors off the very carefully tended greens. The gardens that later became Purple Bamboo Park were originally ordered in the year 1577 by Wan Li, the 13th emperor of the Ming Dynasty. On June 27, 1998, Bao Tong ambled down one of the pathways in the park and settled onto a green wooden bench Across the path, directly opposite Bao, our cameraman, Raleigh Malixi, sat with a camera hidden in a shoulder bag. I came from the opposite direction and sat with Bao, a nearly invisible wireless microphone pinned inside my shirt transmitted our conversation across the path to Raleigh's recorder. There was no telling what would happen next as this soft-spoken man risked everything to test his people's right to be heard. Bao was 59 when he went into prison for revealing state secrets and counter-revolutionary propagandizing. That's the same ambiguous charge that China uses today to jail journalists. Despite prison, Bao looked younger than his 66 years. He was as slender as the reeds nodding in the lake. He wore a teal polo shirt untucked, hanging loosely over black trousers. His smooth face was dominated by outsized silver wire rim glasses. I had noticed that Bao tended to walk holding his arms behind his back as if handcuffed. He surprised me with a complete lack of bitterness about his years in solitary. He said isolation had liberated his mind from Communist Party dogma. He, sorry. Bao began, according to our constitution, I have the freedom of speech. However, whether I do indeed have the freedom of speech, I do not know. I think CBS can conduct a test. Let's see whether I get into trouble after your interview with me. If so, it will demonstrate that our government does not respect our own constitution. What should Americans understand about the struggle in China, I asked. If people can check and balance the power of the government, then the government can be a force for good. Otherwise, it is a dangerous force. Bao told me that China could not progress politically until the party publicly admitted that the Tiananmen Square massacre was wrong. I feel sad, ashamed, and proud at the same time, he told me. Proud of those students, the citizens of Beijing, the people. After a few minutes, we parted. Bao ambled away. I walked in the opposite direction. That's when I noticed, out of the corner of my eye, another cameraman with a shoulder bag. From the zippered opening protruded an absurdly large lens. He was a member of a Chinese secret police surveillance team. Bill, Natalie, and I quickly quickened our pace, slightly but deliberately. A moment later, I saw a furious man sprinting toward us. He was red with rage and closing fast. We began an undignified trot, but the man kept accelerating and screaming, now waving a fist. I began wondering about Chinese jails as we broke into a full run. The man matched our pace. Natalie and I were falling short of breath when I shouted, what's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying, keep off the grass.
I learned a lot about uh, Chinese and their, their legendary patients. Nothing happened to Bao, nothing happened to me, nothing happened to Bill Owens. But several months later, when I was traveling with the president in Ireland at that time, we learned that the secret police had kicked in Natalie Liu's door and had taken her away in handcuffs uh, in front of her school-aged children. I went to the national security advisor and I said, look, I know that we don't always get along all the time, but I really need your help on something. I don't know if that's what did the trick, but a week or so after she was taken away with no information for her family, Natalie was deported to the United States with her family and went on to a long career at Voice of America. But here, in our country, journalism is being attacked in a similar way just now. When I was anchoring the CBS Evening News during the first year of the Trump administration, we were very frank about where the president was telling the truth and where he was not telling the truth. And after one particular broadcast, the president tweeted that CBS News was the enemy of the American people. As it happened, I had lunch with the president at the White House a couple of weeks after that with several other news anchors. And I took the president aside just for a moment and I said, hey, Mr. President, criticize the media. Absolutely, we're used to it and a lot of things we do deserve criticism. But I'm concerned that the rhetoric might incite violence that this enemy of the American people stuff, I literally told him, I'm concerned that some poor deranged individual will break into a newsroom somewhere and shoot the receptionist because she's the enemy of the American people. And the president paused for a moment and he turned to me, and this is a direct quote, the president of the United States said, I don't worry about that. A few months later, I got a call from the FBI and the FBI wanted to tell me that a man who was mailing letter bombs to people he perceived to be the enemy of the American people, people he perceived to be enemies of the president, had a file on me in his computer and had my home address in Darien. This man was arrested before he could mail a bomb to me and my family. It occurred to me recently that I was wrong about what I said to the president. It wasn't the hateful rhetoric about the media that caused a massacre. It was the hateful rhetoric about immigration that led a poor, unfortunate, deranged individual to shoot up a Walmart in August in El Paso, Texas, killing 22 Hispanics because in the gunman's mind, if they were Hispanic, how could they be Americans? 22. Almost as many people as the 17th Connecticut Infantry lost at Gettysburg. There is no democracy without journalism. It's the way we communicate with one another. It's the way we have reliable information. You cannot have a democracy unless everyone has access to generally reliable, generally down the middle information so they can make decisions about their own lives, their lives of their families, and the life of the country. There was a time in America when journalism was even under greater threat. And that was after the passage and the signing of the Sedition Act of 1798. The Sedition Act made it a felony to criticize any member of Congress or the President of the United States. Editors went to jail for criticizing the government. Two years after the Sedition Act was signed by President Adams, 
James Madison wrote a critique of the Sedition Act. It was in 1800. And one of the things he said in that critique is that freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. Madison understood that if we could say what we wanted to say, write what we wanted to write, read what we wanted to read, then all the rights that he put in the Bill of Rights would be protected. The stakes are just that high. That is a fight worth fighting and a truth worth telling. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so grateful for your attention. I'm going to take questions from the audience uh, as long as you care to uh, send questions my way. But thank you again for your, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much ma yes, ma for coming tonight. I've done quite a lot of research about Varian Fry, who was America's Oscar Schindler and lived in Ridgefield. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit to your experience with the International Rescue Committee. About something that's under threat. The International Rescue Committee was uh, conceived by Albert Einstein uh, to get Jews out of Nazi-occupied Europe. And ever since then, the organization, which is based in New York, has grown and grown and grown. It's probably one of the largest NGOs you've never heard of. Uh, but it has grown and grown and grown to be one of the principal organizations that takes refugees who are the most vulnerable people in the world and resettles them in the United States not a popular concept among some in our country these days because of the vitriolic rhetoric that we have all been witnessing and exposed to. These are people who are victims of terrible tragedies that are not of their own making, victims of civil war. For example, what's been happening in Syria, Lord, more than 10 years now. And they come to America to have a new life, to create and to educate and to be part of the great American dream. We're all immigrants, right? We can all trace our family history uh, to some other place on this earth. We're all immigrants. And I would argue that immigrants have always made our country stronger. You know who the best news consumers are? The people who really pay attention to what's going on in this country? Recent immigrants. They watch the news like mad. Why? Because they're trying to figure this crazy place out. And so I have worked uh, over many years with the International Rescue Committee, fundraising and working in places like Afghanistan and Thailand and Iraq and, and other difficult places around the world to try to help these people become resettled and become uh, part of the great American dream. I think that is something that we must not lose sight of. The the thing that makes America great, in my view, is not only our founding document, the Constitution, which we've continued to perfect over the years, but the immigrant nature of our country. We're from everywhere. We have people in this country who have come from all kinds of difficult situations around the world, and they have come here to make this a better place. And I would argue that 99 times out of 100, they have succeeded. Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. It occurred to me when you were talking that the word journal is synonymous with diary. How did journalism come from that? Oh, actually, I guess, you know, journalists are people who, who, uh, keep diaries about the, the things that they've experienced, right, and around the world. Some people have 
talked about the level of detail that I go into about various world events in, in truth worth telling, and they, they ask me, well, you know, how did you remember all that stuff? Well, the answer is I didn't. I have all of my notebooks. I've got I, my wife has always said, are you ever going to do anything with all that stuff? Can't we just throw all this stuff away? You're never going to look in those notebooks again. But I have uh, a hundred uh, reporter notebooks at home from the Iraq War, from Afghanistan, from my time in Washington at the White House, from our trips all around the world. And so I was able to go through those uh, those letters and the letters uh, the those notebooks and the letters that I wrote to my wife from a lot of these places are are full of details that I went back through and so you know it's okay to be a pack rat I think if you're <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna do something with it and so uh, in some ways the stories in this book are are my diary of the things that I've uh, kept up with all through my life. Yes, ma'am, I think we have a microphone coming for you so everybody can hear your question. Hear me okay? Okay. Um, I watch you every Sunday, and I love 60 Minutes. I think you're absolutely phenomenal. We're in our 52nd season. So, um... Knowing that I would be a little bit nervous to speak, you know, I kind of like just wrote out something. Um, first of all, welcome to um, this amazing city, Stanford, to Darien, to Fairfield County. But, um, okay, I, I just think that our country is really, really troubled um, because journalists have truly lost their credibility. Um, there are so many um, stations that I just turn off because it's like, this is terrible. It's truly a war that's going on within America, and I just find it so sad. But uh, can't everybody just tell the facts, like not the journalists, to put their spin on it for the people that they're serving? Because they should be serving us, we the people. We want to hear the facts. We're smart. We could uh, decipher it. We could decide what is going on. Instead of hearing their spin, which has increased their loss of credibility, but um, we don't want propaganda, you know, that, again, that supports the people that they serve, um, again, to serve us. I know President Trump doesn't have the decorum, you know, like he needs a filter. We know that. But I do truly believe that he's a fighter for the American people. And just like General George Patton, he was vulgar. And thank God President Roosevelt did not listen to him, because otherwise our planet would be... Um, if, do I have a question? Yes, my question is about immigration. With Ellis Island, because all of our um, grandparents came from Ellis Island, and they made a contribution to society, what's going on? What's the big problem that we don't have a process? These people are coming into our country, and I find it to be an invasion. Well, you know, uh, but I, 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 I understand completely. Uh, first of all, thank you for speaking up. Uh, that this is what civility is about. There are people in this room who agree with her, and there are people in this room who don't agree with her, but we've all heard her, and now we can reevaluate what we think. We might decide you're right. We might decide that what we, the thoughts that we came into this room with the, today are undisturbed, and we, and we haven't changed our mind. But thank you for speaking up. Um, you have brought up a couple of points, and I'm, I'm going to get to your question, a couple of points that are important to talk about. Uh, first of all, the notion of uh, bias in the media. I could not agree more. You're absolutely right about that. One of the things that happened when the... When I was growing up, there were three television networks, as God intended. <laughs> One of the things that happened with the proliferation of channels is that some channels have found a business model catering to specific political agendas, on the left and on the right. Uh, and so it's a pretty cynical thing. These are people who understand that they are reporting one side of the story, but it works for them because they can split off some of the left and some of the right, and that's a business model 
that works. They can count on that audience, as small as it might be on the two fringes. Uh, you know, what's the fastest way to destroy a democracy? Is it war? Terrorism? Another Great Depression? I don't think so. I think the fastest way to destroy a democracy is to poison the information. And now we are seeing that threat in a couple of ways. One, these digital citadels of confirming information that I talked about earlier, where we can spend all day being told what we already think is right and never have to trouble ourselves with a countervailing view which is the death of democracy in my view, because we can't all live together if we're not all talking to each other. And the other thing that we've seen uh, more recently is hostile nation states that are trying to become involved in our politics by creating all sorts of bogus websites that purport to be uh, American organizations and it's just propaganda coming from Russia, North Korea, China, whatever uh, hostile nation state is out there. They are all involved in that. And so you, all of you, have a responsibility tonight, today, that has never happened in American history. You, before, if you watched ABC, NBC, CBS, read the New York Times, a Stanford advocate, etc., you could be generally uh, assured that the information that you were getting was largely correct in terms of the way it was reported and and usually both viewpoints were represented as it should be that was the great American tradition well now you don't know where these stories are coming from and they are aggregated and picked up by websites and 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 Mark Twain what did he say he said that the that um, a lie goes around the world before the truth can get its boots on. <laughs> so now that is just going at light speed with the internet. So the responsibility that you have, this is the first time in American history, you have a responsibility to do your best to verify the information that you're consuming. Now how do you do that? The, the, the good news here is that is easier now than it ever has been. If you read something and you're just, this is one of the things that I talk about in the book, if you read something and you are just outraged by it or shocked by it, then you should look around and say, what did the New York Times say about that? Or what did the Los Angeles Times say about that? The Wall Street Journal, pick, pick whatever news organization that you wish but triangulate the information. You may discover that the thing that you find shocking and, out, and outraged you uh, maybe didn't happen, or maybe didn't happen the way that you saw it on that internet site. Here's the thing that you can rely on. The name brand media, whichever ones you like, have what I call reputational risk. If I get something wrong on 60 Minutes, uh, my job's in jeopardy. Uh, the, the reputation of 60 Minutes is in jeopardy. We have reputational risks, so guess what? We're working like hell all day, hundreds of people trying to make sure that everything we, we say on 60 Minutes is correct. We're not always right, but boy, we get it right 99% of the time, I would ha hazard to say. But the guy running America for Americans from his basement in a website somewhere, he has no reputational risk. He doesn't care. He'll put anything out there to charge up an audience or get the, the right number of clicks or what have you. And so when you're consuming news from an organization that you don't know, Look for those organizations that have reputational risk. You've never had to do that before, but I would argue that today that you, you do have to do that. Now, the other part of your question dealt with immigration and the burden that immigrants place on our, on, on the taxpayers, on, on um, hospital emergency rooms and schools and all of that sort of thing. I, uh, and, and that is true, that happens. We have to ask ourselves, who are we as Americans? Do we welcome these people into the country? Do we, 
are, are we are we the country that that erected the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, or are we the country that's erecting a wall on the southern border? These have never been easy issues for our country. If you look over the history of the last couple of hundred years, it's a it's a tick-tock of welcoming immigrants and shutting them out. Welcoming them and shutting them out. The Transcontinental Railroad was built by the Chinese. We imported tens of thousands of Chinese workers into this country to build the Transcontinental Railroad. And when they hammered the golden spike in, in completing the railroad, Congress banned the immigration of all Chinese. Total ban. No China, no, no one from China could come to the United States. In World War II, we sent trains to Mexico to bring laborers into the United States because all of our men were overseas, right, fighting. So we needed people to harvest our crops and build our tanks and all that. We literally sent passenger trains into Mexico and brought people into the United States. After World War II, Complete ban on immigration. It goes back and forth. So um, this is one of those times where the, the, the blood of the country is up uh, because the president has decided that um, immigrants are going to be the bogeyman of the moment, uh, in my view. And so we have to have a sensible immigration policy, which we do not have. You are right about that. We don't have a sensible system for allowing immigrants into this country because the people in Congress cannot figure that out. Let me tell you about another thing while I'm on that subject that concerns me a great deal. I remember when members of Congress would fight like cats and dogs all day long and then go down to McSorley's at the bottom of the hill and drink all night together. It used to be that the other guy had a bad idea. Today, the other guy is a bad guy. And you can't compromise with someone who's an evil person. It, it, it is true in Washington, D.C. today that Democrats and Republicans cannot be seen together in any sort of social setting because they'll get clobbered back home during the primaries. You can't have a democracy that way. There has to be compromise. We all have to live together. We are not all going to agree on everything. That's, that's what gridlock is. And so we're going to have to find a way to speak to one another again, to be civil to one another again, to come up with compromises that move the country not left, not right, but forward. And I'm really looking forward to that day. It's going to take, it's going to take leadership uh, in the Congress that we do not currently have, I believe. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let, me, let me speak with this gentleman, I'll come back to you. Um, hi, Mr. Kelly. From one Texan to another. Hey. Um, I had a question for journalists who are recent graduates. You know, it's a landscape that has layoffs, low salaries, low wages at the beginning, and even into mid-level careers. What is your practical advice to journalists who just re recently graduated from college and are trying to break in, even in this uh, tough landscape? Well, it, it, it is a tough landscape. I would, I would hasten to add to that picture that there are more jobs today than there ever have been. Uh, back when there were three television networks, uh, that, that was a limited number of jobs. And now that we have the, the television networks, the cable networks, of course, all the newspapers and websites out there, um, there have never been more jobs available. This is also, in my view, the dawn of the golden age of the documentary because it used to be PBS, and that's the only place that would buy a documentary. And now Netflix and Apple and Amazon are just throwing millions of dollars at documentarians to have them make documentaries. So I think there are a lot of great opportunities out there, but the most important thing that, that I like to say to young people is that 
uh, as Madison said, freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. The stakes are that high. And what I tell young people is we need you. We need you in journalism. Our country needs you. One of the ways you can serve your country is to be involved in credible, serious journalism. Now, I promise this gentleman, and then we'll come back over here. Yes, sir. Here's what, here's what bothers me. Uh, the, uh, I hear politicians sometimes saying, we're, we're better than that. Our country is better than that. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, and it, for me, uh, so I'm speaking as a 90-year-old guy, but I still have a lot of this in my head, okay? The, the, my question is, the, don't you believe as, as, as a journalist, okay, that the power of the presidency, all right, has, has figured out that we're not better than this. We are living in a situation where the division is not on political issues or what sort of legislation, okay, it's predicated on whether or not, this is my opinion, okay, that uh, that the white race, and it has been, in my opinion, fomented, fomented by our president, has created in this country a division based on the color of the others, and it's the others who are the threat as far as our president is concerned. So well, what I, is a good journalist going to do about that? <laughs> well, I take your point. And, and the history of America has been about race from the founding. When, uh, when Jefferson wrote maybe the most magnificent line in the English language, uh, the second line of the, of, the, uh, of the Declaration, that all men are created equal, it wasn't true. He was a slave owner. And we have been paying for that dichotomy ever since. So I don't think you can speak of America without speaking of race. I will say this. Dr. King was fond of, of a quote that originated with a 19th century minister. And the quote, as Dr. King liked to paraphrase it, is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And I would argue that that is the history of our country, constant improvement. Setbacks, absolutely, uh, not anywhere close to perfection, but the arc of the moral universe, while much longer than any of us would desire, throughout our history has bent toward justice. And so I think we're all, everyone in this room, everyone in this country is still trying to perfect the ideal that Jefferson wrote about. Uh, through the Civil War that I talked about earlier and through all of the trials of our country, I think our history is one in general of constant improvement. Um, in terms of demagoguery, the us and the them, well, that's been part of politics since ancient Greece, right? And so that shouldn't be a terrible surprise to us all, but what we seem to do in our country is overcome that. Unfortunately, we have to overcome it repeatedly, but we do always seem to overcome it. You know, um, United States is abbreviated U.S., us, and as my, uh, as my friend Ken Burns likes to say, uh, 
there, there is no them. There's only us. And that is the route to civility. Thank you for your question. Y yes, sir. Talk about the opportunities in journalism and the state of journalism in the U.S., but what about what's happening to the newsrooms in many of the newspapers around the country where they're being decimated and local radio stations are being taken over by large conglomerates that are feeding uh, what their version of the news without local coverage? Very, very worrisome. I, uh, I agree with you completely. We're seeing a lot of consolidation in the, in the media space. Uh, at this point in time, and uh, newsrooms are running on thinner and thinner budgets. But as I said before, there is no democracy without journalism. And so we have to find, we're at an inflection point right now. And we have to find a business model that will ensure robust journalism in this country. Um, does journalism become a nonprofit? I, I, I mean, in the sense of a charity, as opposed to the actual nonprofit of uh, of some journalism organizations, um, is it? Uh, are are the big news organizations of the future called Apple? Are they called Google? I mean, we we have just seen Jeff Bezos uh, buy the Washington Post and flood it with money. Well, that's a great thing. Is that the new business model? Perhaps it is, but your point is very well taken. A new business model needs to be established, is being established as we watch, because in my view, one of the things that made America great is that we have the best journalism in the world. I mean, line them up. Nobody comes close. We have the best journalism in the world in this country because we have the tradition and because we have the best journalism schools in the world. People come from all over the world to study in our J schools. And so we are great because we have great information. It's the only way you can operate a democracy. And we need to find the business model that makes that true for this next century. I take the pleasure of asking the last question? Certainly may. How Im important is it to your career that you came out of CBS where Mr. Salant wrote the rule book on journalism ethics? Well, that's such a great question. And you're talking about Dick Salant, who was the uh, president of CBS News. He was also the guy who did not want to put 60 Minutes on the air. He thought it was a terrible idea. And he stood in the way of it for uh, several years. And Don, and I write about the creation of 60 Minutes and Truth Worth Telling. And Don Hewitt, uh, who was the creator of 60 Minutes, just badgered the heck out of uh, Dick Salant until they finally said, OK, give it a try. And, uh, and now we're in our 52nd year. When I was 17 years old, I wrote Don Hewitt a letter. I was growing up in Lubbock, Texas. It was a stupid letter. It was kind of like, gee, Mr. Hewitt, how do you do it? And I get a, I get a letter back from CBS. It's this buff-colored envelope with the letters CBS in gold. And, and I open it up, and there's a card in there. And it says, dear viewer, your letter has been received, and a reply will be forthcoming. Well, fast forward about 30 years or so. I'm in my first screening of my first story at 60 Minutes with Don, and the lights come up after the screening, and I said, Don, where the hell's my letter? You never wrote me back. Apparently, it was more memorable to me than it was Mr. Hewitt. But uh, to circle all the way back to, uh, back to your question, it meant a great deal to me. I only wanted to work at CBS. This was the, um, Jan was talking about my heroes earlier, right? Dan Rather, uh, Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow, who invented broadcast news during World War II. And it was that rich history 
that I really wanted to be part of. And I'm so glad that I was because the history of CBS News is ingrained in the newsroom uh, and all of our bureaus around the world, even today. And uh, the, the standards, we created the first standards for broadcast news. There's literally a rule book that we all have that's updated every year that tells us what our standards and our style is. I think most viewers would be astonished at how hard we work to get it right, how many people are involved in getting it right, how often we sit in the evening news office or in the screening room at, at 60 Minutes and say, you know, are we really being fair here? Are we representing all the sides that need to be heard from? And we have these debates and these arguments and we go after it every single day. I think many people don't appreciate how much hard work goes into the journalism that we can all take for granted. You can tune into 60 Minutes and it's free. <laughs> you know, you, it doesn't cost you a nickel to watch 60 Minutes unless you're paying a cable fee. But, <laughs> but it's just that amazing. Uh, how journalism in our country has grown to become such a terrific, uh, well-principled thing in the main. Um, are there errant actors out there? Do we make mistakes? Yeah, of course, it's a human endeavor. And so it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it is the best in the world. And that is one of the reasons that our country is so great, because all of you have access to information. I, I had a neighbor in Texas the other day. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm keeping you over time. I'll just tell this very quickly. And um, she thought that uh, every morning, people at CBS got together and told the reporters, told me, uh, what to write and what to think, and this is the way we're going to present the news today. And I had to disabuse her of this notion. I mean, we're having these enormous arguments in the newsroom about how we're going to cover the news today. But I did tell her that that is exactly what happens in China. <laughs> People talk about the media. Oh, the media is terrible. Well, the media in America is about 25,000 television channels, internet sites, radio stations, and television stations that talk about not coordinated in any way, shape, or form. We are, we are working like heck to beat the hell out of each other in the American competitive way. In China, the Ministry of Propaganda literally gets up first thing in every morning and tells all the newspapers and websites and television stations what they're going to report, what photograph they're going to put on the front page, and how they're going to deal with each and every issue. Um, that's what's at stake here. That's what Bao Tong was talking about when he risked everything to talk to not a Chinese network, but an American network that would report what he had to say. It is a, not the enemy of the American people. We are a gift to the American people. And we try to work very hard not to let you down. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Very grateful. Thank you. Elm Street, Elm Street books will be selling the latest copy, and Mr. Pelly will be staying to sign. Dan, thank you. I'm so really good. Thank you for being here.